It does involve obviously these reversible reactions. Um, <clears throat> and again, in a reversible reaction, we do have obviously in the forward direction uh, going from our reactants to products. And if you just sort of start the reaction at, at a very beginning and really all you have are reactants, that is basically what we would expect to basically start to occur is that forward direction uh, because frankly, you have no products. So we would start making some products at that point. We would also start losing some of our reactants like we talked about. And at some point you will build up enough products that actually you will have enough for the reverse reaction to start to take place. And that reverse reaction would be when those products basically recombine and form uh, our reactants. And as we talked about, remember that <clears throat> So as we talked about, it's important to understand that what will eventually happen is it will reach chemical equilibrium. Uh, and again, chemical equilibrium is not meaning that we have the same amount of reactants and products on both sides. It really is referring to the rate of that reverse and forward direction of the reaction. And when it does reach that chemical equilibrium, uh, the rate of the forward direction will equal the rate of the reverse direction. So essentially what happens at that point, and we saw sort of graphically, uh, you know, we have like a time zero, no products, all reactants. And as the reactants start getting used, we start making some products. And eventually what we'll see is, you know, everybody will sort of level out. And because the rate of the forward direction and the reverse direction equal each other, pretty much there's gonna be really no change in the concentrations of your reactants and products after that point, as long as you don't really screw up the equilibrium and you don't do anything to mess it up, they will be able to really maintain uh, their concentrations and even pressures if we're talking about gases uh, in that particular case. Now, <clears throat> it again, doesn't mean that we have the same amount on both sides, which is a common sort of uh, misconception. We also talked about at the end, we'll, we'll address it here uh, at the beginning one more time. Uh, there is the capital K, which is the equilibrium constant. And basically the equilibrium constant is calculated by taking your products over reactants, but it is a constant value for a particular reaction. And really the only thing that can change the actual numerical value of the equilibrium constant is if you actually change the temperature of that reactant. So if you leave the temperature just the way it is and you never ever change it, uh, it will always, when you take sort of the ratio of the product to reactants, it will always equal the same value uh, for a particular reaction. And as we talked about, sometimes that's hard for people to understand, especially in situations where maybe uh, you do one experiment at the same temperature and you basically start with all reactants and no products. And then maybe you do another experiment where maybe you got more of the, you start with more of each of the reactants and maybe none of the products. Maybe do a third experiment where you got a little bit of reactants, you got a little bit of products starting off. And it really doesn't matter sort of how much you start off with, if you use more reactants in one experiment versus less than the other, the ratio will always be the same. And sometimes that's hard for people to understand, but a simple idea of like math, like for example, if we wanted to get the number two, we could get the number two by taking four divided by two, right? That gives us obviously two, that ratio. Uh, we could also do uh, 16 divided by eight. That will also give us two. So there's many different ways you could come up with sort of the same result of the ratio, even though you have different numbers. And that works the same way with these type of equilibrium reactions. So regardless of how much you start with, as long as you keep that temperature the same and you run as many experiments as you want and you calculate the equilibrium constant for each of the experiments that you do, they ideally should be the same number. In reality, they'll be a little bit different if you actually did an experiment, but in theory, they should end up being pretty much the same number. Any questions on any of that stuff there? <clears throat> All right, so uh, I think we were on this slide where we laid it up last time, but just one more time to reiterate, uh, this is the equilibrium constant and 
the number that you see there is for this specific reaction. And when you actually do see an equilibrium constant value given to you for an equation, it is specific for exactly how that equation is written. And it's assumed that, you know, reactant is going to product. So whatever is on the reactant side, whatever is on the product side, if you are given an equilibrium constant value, it is specific for that. So in this particular case, it's specific for these guys being on the reactant side and our NO2 being on the product side. Now, in general, basically the equilibrium constant is basically the concentration of your product divided by your concentration of your reactants. By the way, in case you're not familiar, when you do see a little bracket like that, that means concentration. And the most common sort of unit of concentration that we use is big M, which is molarity. Molarity is what? Yeah. I want to look over here. So it is uh, it is moles over liters, right? Technically, moles of solute over liters of solution. We'll take a field trip back to 200A in a second. It'll be all right. All right. So that is uh, definitely something you should know. Uh, we would definitely will use obviously molarity a lot throughout the semester, but uh, that usually is what those brackets refer to, which is uh, the concentration in molarity moles of the solute over liters of the solution. In general, though, we do take into account uh, in this ratio the actual coefficients from the balanced equation. So those coefficients become the exponents here when we take our products over our reactants. So uh, that is why when we look at the top equation here, uh, the two is why we are going to actually square the concentration there. And here the coefficient is one. So obviously this is basically to the first power so much like in, in most chemistry, we obviously do not write one for most things. Um, so again, if you do not see a number, uh, you could assume that it is uh, going to basically be one. Now, typically speaking, when we do take sort of the concentrations of our product over our reactant, a lot of times people will refer to this as a KC value. I'm going to go out on a limb and go C is probably for concentration. Yeah, so that is basically what KC refers to. Basically, you calculate the equilibrium constant using concentrations and most likely going to be molarity. One of the nice things about sort of the equilibrium constant is it is unitless, which means you don't have to worry about units or things properly canceling out in terms of units. I know it still is a chemistry class, but it is one of those nice things that it's just a number basically. So it is really just a number. So what does this sort of number basically sort of allow you to know? Let's say for example, I have a large value of K. When I reach equilibrium, would I mainly expect to have reactants or products present? I have a large value of K. Yeah. It would be product. So if we just think about it mathematically here, in order to get a large value here, we need a big number on top divided by a small number, right? So we need a larger amount of products at equilibrium uh, divided by a smaller number, which is our reactants. Uh, so we would expect mainly products when we do reach equilibrium. Same idea if we had a smaller value of K, we would expect reactants to be present mainly at equilibrium. And that's the same just mathematically thinking about it. If we have a smaller number up on top, a larger number on the bottom, when we divide that, we will end up with a smaller number. And that tells us that. So one of the sort of advantages or one of the things that the equilibrium constant really does tell you is when that reaction does reach equilibrium, do you expect mainly to have reactants present or do you expect to mainly have products present? And these are good things to think about as we get into some calculations uh, because it can help you understand if you did the calculation right. So, you know, if you had a large value of K and you did a calculation and you got all reactants and no products, Something probably went wrong there through the calculation. So you want to think about those things. Now, what is a large value? Well, clearly it's everybody's large number of one. Yeah. So basically anything above one is considered large. Anything less than one is considered a small value of K. 
Now there is extremes to this. You could have a really large value of K that's like times 10 to the 36 power. You could have a really small value of K, which is like times 10 to the minus 50. So super small value, super large value. And anywhere in between, you could have that. So in generally speaking, if you see a equilibrium cost of value given to you, like we see up there, and I see a negative exponent, it's pretty safe to assume it's probably going to be relatively small. And again, if you have more of a positive exponent there for your equilibrium constant, uh, you could assume that it'll be relatively a large value. Any questions on that? In case you like different letters, you could use this one. All right. <laughs> so as I mentioned, that really large value of one is sort of where we lie. And again, it helps us understand, you know, when we do reach equilibrium, are we mainly going to have those products or reactants going to be there? And again, uh, if you're somewhere near that value of one, then you're kind of like, you know, kind of equally amount of each of those, obviously, because just mathematically speaking, the only way to get one is to have the same number on top and bottom, right? So you got kind of the same numbers on top and bottom, and that's going to mean you're going to have a relatively equal amount of each of those guys there. <clears throat> So if we look at something like this, we got Mickey. He was happy in the morning. Reacts with those two guys and Mickey turned upside down there. And the K value here is uh, 25 degrees, not 25 degrees, just 25. I've uh, been teaching temperature all week, but 25. Uh, so we would expect when we reach equilibrium, should we mainly have reactants or products in this case? So 25, would that be considered small or large? It would be considered large. Again, it is above one, so it's not a big threshold there. And that would mean when we reach equilibrium, again, we would expect to have mainly products present uh, when we do reach equilibrium. Questions on that one there. Now let's talk a little bit about homogeneous uh, equilibrium. Uh, homogeneous equilibrium, just like homogeneous mixture means Homogeneous means when you mix it, everything looks the same throughout. So when we talk about a homogeneous equilibrium, what we're talking about is everybody's in the same phase. So for example, here, everybody's in the gas phase and we could do our products over our reactants and our concentration, our NO2 squared divided by the N2O4. But because these are all gases, we also associate gases with what type of quantity we associate it with? Pressure, yeah. Ideal gas law, a little, it, it, that's right, you can continue on, it's <laughs> PV, NRT, there you go. <laughs> wow, all right, I feel a little bit better, all right. So that's PV equals NRT, uh, that is the ideal gas law, hopefully you're familiar with it. it. Does pop its head up occasionally, not a lot, but it does pop up. A reminder that when you do use, right, the ideal gas law, things do need to be in specific units and, the units there for pressure uh, does need to be atmospheres when you go into the ideal gas law. Uh, v is volume, which needs to be liters. N is moles, so those hopefully should be moles. Uh, T does need to be in Kelvin. While we're speaking about Kelvin, if I have Celsius and I want Kelvin, what do I add to it? Yeah, so 273, the correct number there is 273.15, but you could add 273 to it. And R is the gas constant, and R is 0 0.08206 liters atmosphere Kelvin mole. R, if you like the rounded number, 0 0.0821 is all good too. A lot of people use that these days. So because uh, these are actually gases, we could write an equilibrium constant expression that actually deals with pressures. And we do it the exact same way. That is the partial pressure here squared because of the coefficient of NO2 divided by the partial pressure of N2O4. Once again here, we wouldn't do anything to it because the coefficient is one. And this is sometimes what is referred to as a KP value. P, I'm assuming for pressure. I'm going to go out on a limb on that one as well. So a KC value, typically you calculate the equilibrium constant using concentrations. KP value, you use partial pressures. The good news is in our uh, sort of class here, most of the time they just give you the pressures. A couple of things you do want to 
think about as we go through this chapter and other chapters that typically speaking, this is a lot of times a unit that you do want your pressures to be in, right? One atmosphere is how many tor? 760, yeah. And 760 millimeters of mercury. So later on, when we talk about doing some equilibrium calculations from initial pressures and stuff like that, you do want to make sure usually that your pressure is in the units of atmospheres. Uh, even if they may ask for, for example, your answer in like millimeters of mercury, and they give you everybody a millimeters of mercury. When you go to do the calculation, typically when you're calculating equilibrium pressures, you want to convert it to atmospheres, do the calculation, and then back convert it to whatever you need on the back end. So um, we'll talk about it when we kind of get there as to where you should maybe make sure that you apply that. Now, typically speaking, KP, just like KC, and by the way, we're gonna learn about every K you don't wanna know. Like I said before, we got KC, KP, KA, KB, KSP, KF, I'll just keep going. But we got all these different types of K values with a little subscript. They are all basically the same deal. They're all just products of reactants. They just deal with some different aspects. Obviously, this one deals with pressure. The previous one deals with concentration. But they're all really calculated the exact same way, even though they have little different ones. They typically, though, are not going to be, in most cases, the same numerical value. But they still will tell you really the same piece of information. So in most cases, if you have a KC value for a reaction and you also have a KP value for the same reaction, uh, numerically speaking, the number will be different, but they will tell you the same thing. So if you have a large KC, you probably will have a large KP. And if you have a small KC, you will probably have a large, I'm sorry, a small KC as well. And it makes sense if you just think about it logically. If I have a large KC value, that means, again, when I reach equilibrium, I should have mainly reactants or products there. Products, and then the products are gases. That means I got a lot more gas molecules on the product side, causing a lot more collisions, causing a lot more pressure, which is why we also see the KP value being large as well, because the majority of the partial pressure probably in that mixture is gonna come from the guys on the product side. And the opposite is true. If you had a small value for KC, that means you probably will have mainly reactants there. And probably those reactants would be the ones causing most of the pressure and, and causing the collisions. And you would have, again, a small value of KP. So again, they do tell you kind of the same piece of information, but numerically speaking, may not be exactly the same number in most cases. There is a way to kind of go between the two. And if we wanted to really kind of go between the two, uh, the KP value is equal to the KC value times R and T delta N. So once again, the R is our gas constant here. The T here is our temperature in Kelvin. And the delta N is the change in the number of moles from products to reactants. So you add up all the moles of our product side and you subtract it from all the moles of our reactant side. Again, it needs to be gases. Those are the only ones obviously you would add up on both sides. They do need to be gases. If it's not a gas, then you wouldn't count it. By the way, when I have an equation that's balanced, how do I figure out how many moles of something I have? It is the same as the, the same as the coefficient, yeah? So if it says like 2A, that means I got two moles of A, right? Uh, so the coefficient will tell you how many moles. So basically all you have to do is go and look on both sides. If anybody that has a G, add up the coefficients on both sides for so everybody with Gs, and then do the subtraction. It's really important though, for example, um, say we had something like this. The delta N in this case should be what? So how many moles of A do we have? Moles of B? It's one, right? So if it's not written, it does represent one. So the delta N would be, so one or negative one. 
it should be negative one here because product is B. So that's one minus two, which gives me negative one. Now you may think, does it make a difference? And the answer is yes, because mathematically speaking, when we look at that equation of RT to the delta N, if I take that to the first power versus the negative one power, is math, if that, is that math different? It is, because negative one means you take one over it, right? You take the reciprocal of it. So it's a very common mistake that people make is they just take the difference, but you do need to make sure it's not a negative because when you do the math part, it's a big difference if it is a negative number versus obviously a positive number. So always products minus reactants when you do that. You're just, again, adding up everybody that's a gas and the coefficient. Any questions about that there? <clears throat> Now, when we write an equilibrium constant expression, we do occasionally come across a couple of things that frankly do not change at all or really don't participate in the equilibrium. So if we have this reaction here, which is a little acetic acid, I hope, plus some water, a little acetate and some hydronium ion, if I take my product over reactants, I do get this as my equilibrium expression. Over sort of the hull of the experiment here, the concentration of the liquid water pretty much is not going to change. So it's relatively constant. So because of that, we really do not include the water, which is why it's out here. So I'm just going to scratch it out. And really the proper equilibrium expression for this reaction would actually be the acetate times the hydronium ion divided by the acetic acid concentration. In general, and I'll jump the gun here, in general, pretty much anything that is a solid or a pure liquid. So anybody who's got an S next to it or an L next to it does not get included in the equilibrium expression. That pretty much leaves you just two things that you put in there. And those are things that have an aqueous symbol next to it or things that have a gas symbol next to it. So these things get included. So really things that are pure liquids, usually their concentrations are large enough that frankly, like I said, they really don't change as anything's happening. So you know we don't really need to worry about them. And things that are a solid, as we'll talk about in a second, but frankly, if I had a solid such as my remote here, probably I shouldn't play with that, otherwise the projector can go out. We'll go with the calculator. If I throw this into like a thing of water, right? Is it going to do anything other than float to the bottom? It's not gonna actively participate in anything, right? The only way if you put a solid into say a beaker or a flask or a test tube, the only way it could actually like participate is it would need to dissolve, right? And when it dissolves, it's now ions, and ions are aqueous, so then it would be involved. So anything that is a solid, basically it's kind of sitting there like a rock on the bottom, if you want to think about it, it's really not participating in any of the equilibrium, uh, and anything that's a pure liquid, like I said, pretty much is just going to kind of be the background, if you will. It, there's, the concentration is going to be relatively constant. Any question on that? <clears throat> All right, so why don't you take a second here and for each of these, write the KC expression and also write the KP expression if possible. Let's see what you come up with. The KC there, and again, we wanna do our products over our reactants. So that's gonna be the concentration of NO2. And once again here, because of the four, we do need to take it to the fourth power there. We're then gonna multiply it by the concentration of O2, which is obviously a coefficient of one. We then will take our reactant side and do the concentration of N2O5. And once again, here we will square it because of the coefficient that we see there. Question on that one there. Can I write a KP for this one? I can because I got gases, right? So we can write a KP expression for this one. The KP expression will be the partial pressure to the fourth power of NO2. Again, our products. 
times the partial pressure of O2 divided by the partial pressure squared because of the coefficient here of N2O5. So for that one, we can write obviously two different expressions for it. One on the left there, obviously dealing with concentrations. One on the right would be dealing with pressures. Any questions on that one? Going to the bottom here, we'll do a little KC action. We'll do our products, which is our H3O plus, our F minus. We're going to go over our reactants here, which is HF. Do I include this? I do not because it is a pure liquid, so we would not include it. And that would be our KC expression. Can I write a KP for this one? I cannot, there's no gases. So you kind of need some gases, yeah. Do I put the, yeah, you do, yeah, you do, yeah. No, uh, because uh, this is, uh, the, the brackets in this case refer to uh, concentration, as opposed to if you're drawing like a Lewis structure, you would maybe do something like that. Yeah. Other questions? Now, if I were to actually calculate the values here for the equilibrium constants, be it a Kp or Kc, I would need obviously equilibrium concentrations. So they would need to be equilibrium concentrations or they would need to be equilibrium pressures of everybody, obviously to put actual numbers into there and get a value. <clears throat> All right, so why don't we try one here? Let's calculate both the Kc and Kp. Uh, for this reaction, which is right there, there it is. Uh, if we have uh, 0 0.012 molar CO, uh, 0 0.054 of the Cl2 and 0 0.14 molar of the COCl2 at equilibrium here. So we want both the KC and KP, so take a moment or two and see what you come up with here. Okay, let's take a look, see how you're progressing. So in this particular case, it would make sense to solve for which one first, the KC or the KP? It would be, obviously we're given concentration, so that seemed pretty logical. Uh, we could write our KC expression here, which would be our product over our reactants. So that's gonna be concentration of COCl2 divided by the concentration of CO and our concentration of CL2. Uh, just pop our numbers now in uh, the equilibrium concentration. So as I was just mentioning, they do need to be obviously equilibrium concentrations to go into here. Uh, got like a uh, 0 0.012 and a 0 0.054 happening there. And we do a good little calculator move here and divide it out. And we end up uh, with like, 216, you know, if we're like sig fig wise, like a 220 maybe or something like that, since that is all two significant figures and we're dividing, right? And it is chemistry, I suppose, yeah. First off, any question on that there? So now that we actually do have the KC value, we could use that formula that we saw earlier to go from the KC to the KP value. And that formula, I believe, is Kp is equal to Kc, a little Rt delta n. Uh, so obviously, we have our Kc, rounded or unrounded. Uh, R is our gas constant. We do need to convert our temperature here into Kelvin. Uh, so that's going to be a uh, temperature in Kelvin, 74 plus a 273. And that's going to give us like a 347. Kelvin. Now we also want to figure out our delta N. So in this particular case, delta N is equal to on this side, that is a gas and we have a coefficient of one. So that is one minus one gas molecule there plus one more there makes two. So this is a negative one for our delta N. The questions on that there. All right, now that we got all of that, yeah. Yeah, so it's always products minus reactants for the delta N, yeah. Products minus reactants. And it, 
important to do that. As we see in this particular example, we do get a negative number, which mathematically, again, would be different if we just simply just took the difference between the two, right? Other questions? <clears throat> okay, uh, so then we could just uh, pop some numbers in here, I think. So I'll use the uh, rounded number. If you didn't use the rounded number, you got a slightly different answer, 0 0.08206. Uh, we got a 347, and all that's going to go to the negative one. So probably want to do the parentheses first there, 347 times 0 0.08206. And again, if you use 0 0.0821, that's all good, too. Uh, we're basically going to take the one over that answer, which is what the negative one means. And then we're going to multiply it by 220 or 216. It's going to yield us a 7.7 .7 here as our KP value. Question on that one there. Are these values large or small? They are large. So when we reach equilibrium, we would expect many to have products that are there. Um, and it does sort of make sense. If you just kind of look at the concentrations, we got 0.14 there for our products and a little bit less there on our reaction side. We also see that both the KP value and the KC value do not agree in terms of their actual numerical value, but they do agree in terms of what they tell you as 7.7 .7 would also be considered a large value for KP. Uh, so they both would be considered a large value. Um, and again, just numerically different number. Yeah. In this particular case, since we were actually looking for both answers, um, I used a rounded number. If we really weren't looking maybe for both answers, you could use the 216 and continue on with the calculation. So normal rules sort of apply, like you probably learned, you do want to usually wait to the kind of the end to clean everything up and stuff like that. And I'll be honest with you, in most cases, that's probably what I do in most cases. Yeah. And you should probably do that in most cases. And if you did use a rounded number like that, um, you know, you'd be okay, yeah. I'd take 7.6 too. It would be okay. As long as you didn't have like, you know, 7.6, 2, 5, 6, 8, 9, 10, you know, 30 numbers to wrap around the page or anything like that. Yeah. All right. So since it is a chemistry class, I'm sort of a chemistry teacher. We should say we should try to get the correct number of significant figures, right? And um, And you should try to do that. But I am probably more interested in the calculation part. So, you know, if you miss it by one, I'm probably not going to heavily dock you unless it's a habitual problem all over the place and stuff like that. Yeah, but you should try to get the right number of six things. Yeah. <clears throat> all right, any other questions on that there? Just a reminder as well, please, no pictures and stuff like that. It is being recorded. You could go back and watch it to put you to sleep later and see everything. All right, thank you. All right. All right, so let's try this one here. The equilibrium constant Kp for this reaction is 158. Uh, what is the equilibrium pressure of O2 if the pressure of NO is 0.4 and the pressure of NO is 0.27? I know I'm missing a two, and I'm going to take a guess. I'm going to go with NO2 as the first one. Hope for the best. All right. <laughs> Maybe the second one, but we'll go with the first one. Why not? Our products over our reactants. But in this case, we're going to do the partial pressures here. So that's going to be the partial pressure squared of NO uh, times the partial pressure of O2. That would then be divided by the partial pressure squared because of the coefficient of NO2. And that would equal 158, it looks like. In this case, uh, we do have a couple of the uh, pressures given to us at equilibrium. And uh, in this case, we have NO, which I chose as 0 0.27, and we're going to square it. We are looking for O2's pressure divided by uh, 0.4, which I'm also going to square, and we're going to take 158. So we're going to uh, multiply this to the other side, right? And if we do that there, uh, we end up with uh, 158 times... 0.4 squared, and we end up with uh, 0 0.270 squared pressure of O2 equals 25, looks like, uh, 0.28.
we're then going to divide this to the other side, right? And when we do that, we got uh, 0.27 squared. And gonna give us a partial pressure here of O2 of about 347. Do I need units on this? I do need units because this is a pressure. So I do need the same units as we see up there. So uh, 347 atmosphere pressure. We did not need units on the previous problem because we calculated equilibrium constant. So we don't need any units on those guys. Any question on that calculation there? 158 would be a large value of K, which means we should have a lot of products at equilibrium. And I imagine we have a good amount of O2 since it has about 347 atmospheres of pressure. Yeah, so that's a lot of O2 probably flying around and having collisions. Any questions on it? Yeah. <clears throat> All right, so let's talk a little bit about heterogeneous equilibrium. Uh, kind of works the same way, and we kind of touched upon it earlier. But heterogeneous equilibrium is when, obviously, uh, we have things in different states. So like a heterogeneous mixture, uh, you can see different sort of layers and stuff like that. In a heterogeneous uh, equilibrium, you have reactants and products in some different states. So in this case, got a little decomposition happening here. So we got solid, we got solid, and we got gas. And much like we talked about earlier, again, those solids are pretty much just gonna kind of sit there and really not sort of participate in a sense. Um, and they will remain relatively constant. So although we normally do our products over reactants here, we would get rid of those guys that are constant. And that means that frankly, this would be the appropriate KC expression, which is just the concentration of our CO2. And because CO2 is a gas and everybody else is a solid there, we could also write a KP expression for it, uh, which would be the partial pressure of CO2. So once again, a reminder, as we talked about a little bit earlier there, uh, solids and anything that is a liquid, uh, we do not include in the equilibrium expression. Again, that again leaves you your aqueous and your gases that should be put in there uh, when you do it. What happens if I had uh, something like, I'm not sure, let's see who, uh, like. So let's say that's a solid and I have a gas on the other side. If I wanted to write my K expression, how would I write it? So this one would be included. So we basically would just do one over the concentration of A. So if you happen to have everybody on the product side where nothing should be included, but something on the reactant side is included, you do one over basically the reactants is how you would write the expression. Questions on that there. And again, uh, as we can kind of see here, uh, it's really the gas molecules that are moving around, participating in the equilibrium. You know, really our solids are just kind of hanging out and really not doing all that much going on. Same thing there. All right, so let's take a look at another one here. Uh, consider the following equilibrium. Uh, the partial pressure of each gas here is 0.265. Uh, let's calculate both the KP and the KC in this case. All right, let's take a look. Uh, so once again here, uh, we are given partial pressures. So KP would be the appropriate move. In this case, our KP expression would be the partial pressure of NH3 uh, times the partial pressure of H2S. And am I gonna include this guy? I'm not again because it's a solid, so we would not include it. Probably why we don't have any pressure given to us for it. Uh, so basically, here we're going to take a 0.265 times a 0.265. And that's going to give us. Yeah, uh, 0.265. There we go. That gives us uh, something like. Uh, Looks like 7.0 times 10 to the minus two. 
as our O2, I guess. There should be like a two, probably. 7.02 times 7 to the minus 2 as our KP value. Any questions on that one? Once again, here in this case, we have the KP, and that's going to allow us to get to the KC by using our same formula we used earlier. Uh, KP is equal to our KC, a little RT delta N action. And uh, in this case, they were nice enough to uh, give us our temperature in Kelvin, so we're good there. Uh, we do want to calculate our delta N, which again is our products minus our reactants. Uh, so in this case, that is going to be two minus zero, which equals two. Again, uh, one gas molecule there, one there, and nothing over here, basically. Yeah. So at this point, we got our KP, which is uh, 7.02 times 10 to the minus two equals the KC, which is what we're looking for. Uh, once again here, whichever R value you want to use, I use that one because it was beat in my head and I can't get it out. So we'll go with that, 295, and we're going to square it. So we may want to clean this part up first. So we'll do a 0.08206 uh, times a 295. We'll do a little square root action, not square it. We'll square it and not square root it. Uh, so that gives us uh, 7.02 times 10 to the minus two equals KC and something like 586.0127393. We're then going to round, divide that to the other side and if we do that, it's gonna give us a KC value of about 1.20 times 10 to the, looks like four, maybe one, two, three, negative four. Question on that one there. <clears throat> Mainly uh, reactants or products at equilibrium here. We should mainly have reactants at equilibrium here. Uh, so just a little bit, it's probably going to break apart. Uh, and then once again here, no units needed for either the KC or the KP. Once again, uh, they're not going to be the same numerical value, but they're both considered small values of K, which again tells you the same idea. Should probably mainly have reactants here at equilibrium. Question on how to calculate KC, KP, convert between them. You do need to know how to do that, yes. And you do need to know the formula. It will not be provided for you. So make sure that you know it. Yeah. Any questions on that? <clears throat> okay. So next thing we're gonna talk about here with equilibrium uh, constant values is a couple of ways that we sometimes need to uh, manipulate equations. Uh, so for example here, if we were to have two separate equations, and as you may be familiar with, or maybe not, because they don't teach it anymore. <laughs> we teach it here. But not all reactions uh, do take place in uh, sort of one step. So a lot of reactions do occur in sort of multiple steps. So maybe in other places they teach Hess's law in the first semester. Here we do it here in this semester. But if you ever had anything to do with Hess's law, where you took a bunch of different equations, kind of put them together to make an overall equation, um, it's the same idea. Now, in certain cases, we may need to take several individual equilibrium reactions and kind of put them together to build an overall reaction that we're looking for. Now, just a reminder that when we do add equations together, you can think of the, equal, uh, the arrows as equal signs. And anything that's on opposite sides of the arrows and opposite equations can reduce down or cancel completely, like you're subtracting it to the other side. Um, on the left-hand side of the arrow stays on the left-hand side of the arrow, everybody on the right-hand side stays on the right-hand side when you add them together. So in this case, the C's on the left and the C's on the right will cancel. The D on the left and the D on the right there will cancel. That leaves us A plus B, makes E plus F. Again, everybody on the left stays there. Everybody on the right stays there. When we look at the equilibrium expression for the first reaction, it is this one, it is our products over reactants, which is C times D divided by A times B. And if we look at the equilibrium expression there for the second reaction, which would be this one, it is E times F divided by C times D. When we look for the final equation that we got added together, it is basically E times F 
divided by a times b. The way we get that is by multiplying both of those k values together. And when we do that, these guys cancel, leaves us e f on the top, a b on the bottom there. Yeah. Come up there. <clears throat> Now, unlike something, if you are familiar with uh, enthalpy or things like that, where you kind of add the values together, when you add several equations together to make an overall equation, to get the K value for the overall equation, you actually multiply all the K values together. So it's a little bit different. People always want to add them together. You actually will be multiplying them together. So if the reaction is basically a sum of individual reactions, you actually multiply all those K values together to get the overall one. And that will give you obviously what you're looking for. So that's one common thing that we sometimes have to do throughout the different chapters here is kind of put a, several equations together and you will in occasion need to know you kind of what is the K value of that equation that you put together. And again, you get it by multiplying all of the K values together. Any questions on that there? A couple of other things that we also will sometimes do to manipulate equations is sometimes we may not need the equation the way it's written. So maybe we need our reactants to be on the product side and maybe we need the products to be on the reactant side. So sometimes we do need to reverse the reaction. And that is what happens between these two reactions here. Basically, it is the reverse of the first reaction. Now, as I mentioned before, the K value when you are when you do see it is specific for the equation the way it's written. So the correct K value for the equation on the left where N2O4 is the reactant is 4.63 times 10 to the minus three. But when NO2 is the reactant, it is actually 216. The difference is this basically, uh, this guy here and this guy here are the inverse of each other, right? So mm -hmm. if you reverse a reaction, you take one over the K value and that will give you the K value for the new reaction. So if you add equations together, the K values get multiplied. If you need to reverse a reaction, you take one over the K value which is a very common thing that you uh, typically will do. Any questions on that? By the way, if a couple other things that you may do is something like this. So say we had an equation such as this and we had a K value of five. Let's say that we didn't need one A, but we needed two A's what we would have to do is multiply that entire equation by two. So we take 2A plus 2B, 2C plus 2D. Now, if we write the equilibrium expression for the first reaction, that is the concentration of C times the concentration of D divided by the concentration of A times the concentration of B. If I write the expression for this reaction here, that is K is equal to the concentration of C squared times concentration of D squared divided by the concentration of A squared and the concentration of B squared. What is the difference between this K expression and that K expression? They are squared, yeah? So if I multiply by two, the way the K value is affected is I need to square it. So this guy would be K is equal to five squared. I think that's 25. I hope. Yeah. So another very common way that you can manipulate an equation is you may need to multiply it by a common number. So unlike when you do delta H's and things like that, you don't multiply the K value, but you actually would square it in that case by that common number. If I multiplied by three, I would then take the K value to the third power. Yeah, if I multiply by four, take it to the fourth power. So basically whatever number you multiply the equation by, that is the power you would take the original K value to and that will give you the correct K value. Question on that. Now, what happens if I change my mind or I started with the bottom one and I need to divide everybody by two? 
that would then bring me back to this equation, right? Which would bring me back to this expression. Going from this expression back to that expression, what are you doing? You're taking the square root, yeah? So I divided it by two, so I'm gonna take the square root of it. If I divide by three, I would take the cube root of it. If I divide by four, I take the fourth root. And I don't know how to say the fifth root, but maybe it's the fifth root, right? If you divide by five and so forth. So the other two common ways that you can manipulate an equation is you may need to multiply by a common number. Then you would take the K value to whatever that common number is. Or if you need to divide by a common number, you would take the basically root of that K value to whatever you divided it by. Any question on that? Obviously, if I take the square root of this guy, I'm back over here, right? So five. Question on how K values are changed as you manipulate the equation. So again, a very common error a lot of people make when they uh, sort of have to do those things is they kind of fall back on sort of, if you ever learned about uh, enthalpy, which we'll learn about later, but uh, they multiply or they, you know, kind of uh, divide instead of taking things to the roots or squaring and multiplying and things like that. Any questions on that? <clears throat> All right, so why don't you try one here? We want to know what is the K value of this equation uh, using these two equations here. 